Well, I'm preaching a series of messages entitled Transformation. And uh, what I mean by that, we're going from, we go from the human to the divine. I don't mean you become God, but I do mean that the divine comes into your life. And I, I pointed out to you two or three weeks ago that that happens in a moment of time. It happened in Nicodemus' life. Jesus said, you must be born again. And the moment he trusted God, he was born from above, and that crisis experience of the new birth took place. But you don't get perfected at that moment. You don't become mature at that moment. It's a crisis in a process, and God begins to work in our life. The Holy Spirit begins to nudge us and woo us along and bring us to a place of total surrender to the Lord, where we make him Lord of our life, and we walk in the Lordship of Christ, the Holy Spirit controlling our life as we walk with him. So it's a crisis in a process. And what we're doing, what I'm doing is going through the scriptures and showing you different individuals that were human, but because of putting their faith in God, their life was transformed. This morning, we're going to look at two Old Testament characters, an individual by the name of Moses and his wife Zipporah. You may not have ever known about Zipporah. You may never have heard that name before, but you will see how important she is. These were two individuals that were just humans. They were, they were, their lives were messy, and you're gonna, I'm going to point out some of the messiness that was going on in their life. Uh, not to put them down, but just to show you that God has a plan and a purpose. And as we cooperate with him, no matter how messed up our life might have been, a transformation happens and the Holy Spirit begins to work in our life. That begins, Peter says, that begins when we put our trust, look at verse 3, it's by his divine power that God gives us everything that we need for living a godly life. If you turn the power on, the power will light the room. But if you never throw the switch, the lights never come on. But we turn the light on when we invite Jesus into our life. And he says, we have received this. How do you get it? By coming to know him. And the word know is not just get acquainted. It means to get to know him in depth, like a husband and a wife that spend time together, get to know one another in depth and, and in darkness and in light and in valleys and on mountains. You get to know him. And he says, these are the promises. Oh, don't you love the promises? The promises enable you to share in his divine nature. So messy, yes, but maturing, God brings his nature to bear on the mess in our life and brings correction. Now, we're going to look at Moses and Zipporah for just a moment this morning. And I'm going to read lots of scripture. Uh, I believe the best sermon in the world is the Word of God, and the best preacher is the Holy Ghost. I'm going to try to get out of the way this morning. I'm going to let the Word speak, and we're going to read numbers of Scripture today. You listen as the Holy Spirit begins to preach through the Word as I read it and share it with you this morning. Okay, uh, Exodus chapter 2, verse 1. It begins by, some, well, let me give you a little background first. God called a man named Abraham to leave his past and to follow him. Abraham had a son named Isaac who had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob had 12 sons, and one of his sons was named Joseph. And through a series of events, Joseph, because of the jealousies of his brothers, you ever have a problem with some of your brothers, some of your sisters and your family? They, they sold Joseph into slavery. And Joseph spent some time as a slave and wound up in jail for uh, over two years of his life. But God miraculously delivered him and brought to bear his perfect plan in Joseph's life. Even if, we heard it sung this morning, if things don't work out just like we want, even if God still has a plan. And God worked in Joseph's life. 
Well, Joseph became the second most powerful person in all of Egypt through a series of events. And, and that's marvelous. And you remember that story from Sunday school lessons. Joseph then moved his family down to Egypt. And when he moved his family there, there were only 70 of them in number. But he moved them there and cared for them in a time of famine. And they became known as the Israelites. God began to bless them. And though they were just 70 when they moved there, they began to multiply. And, 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 and they became so very prosperous that they began to outnumber the Egyptians. Well, the Egyptian pharaoh became worried and scared about these people they had in slavery, that they would come out of slavery and overpower them. So he said to the midwives, who would go and help the, uh, the Israelites when they were having children, when they were giving birth. He told the midwives, he said, when you go into these Israelite homes, I want you to take the boy babies that are born because they're getting to be too many, take them down and throw them in the river. Well, he come to, they come back and give their report. And you remember, uh, he said, why, why haven't you taken care of these babies that are being born? And the midwife said, well, these Israelites are strong people. And he said, when we get there, they're so strong, the women have already given birth, so there's nothing we can do about it. And so the Pharaoh, who was the head man in Egypt, passed an edict, a law, and said, all the mothers in the Israelites' family, it's your responsibility to abort your baby. When that baby's born, you're to kill that baby. You're to take that baby, throw it in the river, drown it. And uh, so that's where we begin the story. Now, Exodus 2, verse 1, says a man of the house of Levi went and so, uh, took a wife, a daughter of Levi. Their names, by the way, was Amram and Jochebed. And so the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took him and built a little ark of bulrushes for him and daubed it with asphalt and pitch and fixed it where it wouldn't sink. And she took the child, put it in it, just like the king had said, Pharaoh had said, put it in the river. And she laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister... By the way, uh, Amram and Jochebed had three children. The oldest was a girl named Miriam. And then there was a second child named Aaron. And then Moses was the youngest child. And so Moses is his baby now. And his sister, I don't know how old she was, maybe 16, 14, 15, something, I don't know. His sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. And as she's watching, now this is human. All this is human is going on now. And then the daughter of Pharaoh comes down to bathe at the river. Let me stop just a minute. Now that's not human. The daughter of Pharaoh would not normally bathe in a muddy river. She was the Pharaoh's daughter. She would have been bathing in the palace and had all the oils and all of those things that were happening there. But her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw among the reeds, she sent her maid. She saw this little ark among the reeds, and she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it up, she saw the child. And I guess maybe the sunlight must have hit the face of that little child, and behold, the baby wept. And so she had compassion on him. Her heart got so moved as she saw this baby, and she said, this is one of the Hebrew children. And then his sister, Miriam, said, who's been watching all this, she says to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she can come and nurse the child for you? And you just think about all that. That's not, that's not human that that's all happening. There's a God who's overruling in all of this. And God, is caused, he causes the baby to smile, to capture the attention just at the right time uh, of this Pharaoh's daughter. And Miriam just happened to be right over there. And she speaks up and says, hey, would you, you're going to need somebody to nurse that little child. I know a Hebrew woman that could do that for you. Would you like for me to go call her? Okay. 
Now Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. She called Jochebed. And then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Well, Jochebed, you take this child away and nurse him for me. Now get this, and I'll give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. And the child grew and brought him to Pharaoh's daughter then. After a period of time, Jochebed brings him back. And I have no doubt that during all of this time, Jochebed is training that little boy and telling him, there's something special about your life, Moses. There's something wonderful about you. God has a plan for your life. There's a God in heaven. Pharaoh is not the king of the universe. God's the king of the universe. Now I'm going to have to take you and put you back in the palace. And you keep a, you do what you're supposed to do there. But you remember who you are. You remember there's a purpose for your life. And so the child grew. And she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son. So she called his name Moses. The Egyptian named Moses. Jochebed didn't name him. I don't know what she called him, but the Egyptian woman called him Moses because that's what it means. The word Moses means to draw him out of the water, and he was drawn out of the water. Now, all of that was human. Now, let's see. And, and there was a divine touch in all of that. But let's go on with the story, and I, and I want to see if it stays divine or if it turns human. Now, what I need to tell you also is between verse 10 and verse 11, 40 years go by. And so 40 years later now, verse 11, it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out to his brethren and he looked at their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his brethren, one of his brothers, and so he looked this way, and he looked that way. Now, this is human. <laughs> You've got to get, capture this. He looks this way, he looks that way, and, and he, he saw no one. And so he said, I'll take charge of this. I'm going to be the deliverer. And I he killed the Egyptian. And then notice what he tried to do. <laughs> He's going to cover it up, put him in the sand. And he has in mind that he's going to deliver Israel one person at a time and hide them in the sand. Oh, my. How foolish we get sometimes in our human plans. Well, let's go to Acts 7. And this gives a history now of why. That took place. It says, now when he was 40 years old, and I told you that he was 40 at this time, it came into his heart. Get this. It came into his heart to visit his brethren. He just had this idea, the children of Israel. And seeing why he happened to see one who was suffering wrong. And so he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. Now get this. And underline the word supposed. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God was sending him as to deliver them and deliver them by his hand. But they didn't understand. <laughs> it's amazing to me. How many times do we suppose and reason something? Now Moses, think about this. Think about it a minute. He's going to deliver these people who've been in slavery for 430 years and they've become such a large nation that the Pharaoh's worried about them and started killing them off one at a time by the babies. And Moses decides he's going to become the deliverer and he'll do it one person at a time and hide them in the sand. He supposed that the people would have understood. That's what he thought. But that really didn't happen that way. And so the next day, he appeared to two of them as they were fighting. So there must have been a lot of turmoil going on. Two of the Israelites. And he tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you're brothers. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you a judge and a ruler over us? You want to kill me like you did the Egyptian yesterday? 
the words out. Moses, he must have left a toe out or something. He thought he had the guy hidden well, but under the, somehow uh, they had seen it, the words out. And so Moses becomes frightened now, and Moses gets on the run, okay? Now, this is all a part of what I'm reading to you from Acts, is a part of the sermon uh, that a guy by the name of Stephen preached. And he goes all the way from Abraham to Jesus, and it's a summary. Uh, and he tells us why Moses did all of this. Now, uh, Acts 26, verse 30, or verse 29. Then at this saying, Moses takes off, and he flees, and becomes a dweller in the land of Midian. Midian, that would be Saudi Arabia today, where he had two sons. So he gets married while he's there, and that's important for the story that we're looking at. We'll see it in a moment. Uh, he had two sons. Uh, Eliezer, Eliezer and uh, Gershom was the two boys. And when he was 40, 40 more years had passed. So how old is he now? He's 80. He spent the first 40 in Israel learning to be somebody, and God takes him to Midian to teach him that he really is a nobody. <laughs> and when 40 years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, and that's Jesus, in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. Okay, now that's God. He's 80 now. God shows back up. Is it possible that God took 40 years to work the self-sufficiency out of his life? Is it possible maybe that it took Moses 40 years to realize he couldn't do it by himself and so he lets God show up in his life? I'm trying to point out to you again, there were crisis experiences that happened in Moses' life, but then there was the process. It took God 40 years to work that out of him. Some of us, he'd been working on us for 40 years. Some of us, more than 40 years. And some of us are still stuck back there like we were when we first met him. And God wants us to grow. He wants us to develop and become stronger in him. Now, here's the great thing, though, and this is what I want to get across to you. He's an imperfect human. In my research and preparing the message, I came across this quote. It was by an unnamed author. I couldn't find out who wrote it, but I think it was probably Dallas Willard. And Dallas made this statement. Well, that's, I'm at the wrong place. I'll, I'll give you that in a minute. We're not there yet. Moses, when God begins to call him, and talk to him and try to help him, he starts offering excuses why he can't go back to Egypt and become the deliverer. God comes up with this plan to deliver the Israelites. They've been in slavery now 430 years. And he starts offering some excuses up to God. And then watch the excuses he shows that he gives him. Exodus 3, verses 10 and 11. Come now, therefore, and I'll, God says to him, I'll send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Have you ever said to, the, to God when God said, I have a job for you, Who am I? to be able to do that. Uh, we, we've all said that at some point. Well, he offers up a second excuse. He says, Moses answered and said, but suppose uh, uh, when, I, when I come to the children of Israel, they're going to say to me, who sent you? And they say, what's his name? What will I say to him? And here's his next question. Who are you? Who am I? Who are you? That's human. And I love God's answer. God said, you just tell them I am. The I am has sent you. Okay, he comes up with another excuse. Verse 4. He says, Moses answered and said, suppose I just, suppose if, if <laughs> and just watch the times that he says suppose here. Look at this. 
Then Moses answered and says, but suppose they'll not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say, the Lord has not appeared to you. Now that's human. And it's the third excuse that Moses comes up with. Who am I? Who are you? And suppose they won't listen. Okay, now watch God show up again in verse 2. God says back to him, what's that in your hand? And he said, huh? This is a shepherd's rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground. So when he threw it on the ground, it became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. One, my old preacher, I heard him say one time, the Lord said to Moses, uh, what's that in your hand? And he said, a rod. He said, throw it down. And he throwed it down. And he said, uh, when, when he throwed it down, he said, it become a snake. And the Lord said, pick it up again. And, and my old preacher said, he said, Lord, I never could talk real good. And now I can't hear good either. <laughs> uh, and the Lord said, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. And he reached out his hand and he caught it and it became a rod in his hand. Now let me tell you something about the rod that he throwed down. <laughs> Up until he put it down, the Bible always called it Moses' rod. But when he laid the rod down, it became the rod of God. God equipped him with a rod, but he had to lay it down and let the power of God infuse it. God has gifted some of you with wonderful gifts. But I want to tell you something. Your gift can become your greatest hindrance if you don't lay it down and surrender it for God to use it. It can cause you a lot of trouble. And so just remember that in the process. So the Lord said, reach out your hand. And he did. And this thing became a rod again in his hand. Well, verse 10. Moses said to the Lord, you'd think by this time his excuses, he'd have quit giving them. And he said, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. Neither before nor since am I. Uh, neither before you talked to me nor now. I still can't talk. That's what he's saying. I couldn't talk before you, you touched me, and I still can't. And said, uh, you've spoken to your servant. But he said, I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Now, let me ask you a question. Is that true? Was Moses slow of speech and slow of tongue? Most people say, yeah, that's what the Bible says. No, the Bible doesn't say that. Moses said that. God didn't say that. Now, I want to show you, and I'll show you in the Scripture. God, Moses was not slow of speech. It's not true. And for, back to Acts again where God's writing, and God says, and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, get this, now watch this, and was mighty in words. God had equipped him and given him the ability to speak well. But Moses says, well, I just can't handle that, Lord. I can't do that. Now, I'm making a big point out of that, and, and, and I'll show you why in just a moment. Because so many times I've had people to say to me, well, I can't do that. I can't speak in public. I can't pray in public. I can't give a testimony. Who said you can't? God said to Moses, Moses, who made your mouth in the first place? <laughs> God can help you to be strong in speech as well. Now, you may not be a gifted speaker, and it may, may scare you, but don't tell me that God can't speak through you. God can cause you to be strong in areas where you think maybe you're weak. Now, think about all the excuses. Who am I? Who are you? What if they won't listen? I can't just send somebody else. I'm showing you all of that to show you sometimes. And I thought about this this, this week. Ernie, I was looking at this and reading it, and I thought, you know, I wonder if God just ever thought, Moses, won't you just shut up? You've, you've wasted two whole chapters in my book, the Bible, <laughs> with excuses. And Moses, let me tell you, it's not about you in the first place. It's about me and what I can do through you. So quit making excuses. And he throws excuses up. Well, 
Why did God put all that in the, in the Word anyway? I think it was because God wanted us to see that in humanity, we can still question sometimes the mission that God has for us. But don't do that. That's human. That's human. I want to give you four M's. I'll do these quickly. One, I want you to notice the mission. God calls him. Exodus chapter 4, verse 18. So Moses went and returned to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, after he finally gets the mission, sees the burning bush, let me go and return to my brethren who are in Egypt and see whether they're still alive. And Jethro says to Moses, go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses, now he's back in Midian, go return to Egypt. And just to encourage him, God says, for all the men who sought your life are dead now. It's okay to go back. I've taken care of all those things. So he gets submission from God. God calls him. And then God gives him a ministry. God gifts him. Listen to me. Please see and notice that God is involved in all of this. He doesn't call himself. He doesn't get a message from, God, for, for, from his own mind. God gives him the message. And then God calls him into the ministry. And Moses, Exodus 4, verse 20, took his wife, his sons, and set them on a donkey. Now, it's important for you to grasp the fact he's taken his family with him. And you will understand why in a moment. And he returned to the land of Egypt. And so Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And you wouldn't have to tell me to take that rod. If I, if I was Moses, I would want to have that. And he gives him miracles then. God anoints him with miraculous power. Verse 21, the Lord says to Moses, when you go back, see that you do these wonders before Pharaoh. Uh, if it would have been me... <laughs> You wouldn't have had to said, be sure to take the miracles. I would have taken that rod with me and I would have lined them up when they said, I don't, you know, I don't know whether I believe you or not. I'd have said, you stand right over there at that end of that rod and watch this. <laughs> I'd have thrown that rascal down and let that snake show up. But anyway, see that you do these wonders before Pharaoh, which I've put in your hand. But I'm going to harden his heart so he'll not let the people go. So before he ever gets there, God tells him, he's not going to listen. And I'm going to bring miracles and he's still not going to listen, okay? And then here's the message. God gives him the message to deliver. Exodus 4, verse 22. Then you'll say to Pharaoh, this is when you're to deliver the message. Thus says the Lord, Israel's my son, my firstborn. So I say to you, let my son go, that he may serve me. But if you refuse, he says, if you refuse, to, I'm telling you, Pharaoh, I'm, I'm telling you what's going to happen ahead of time. I'm going to kill your son. Pretty tough message. But there's grace there. God says before these plagues ever start, before any of that ever takes place, he said, I want you to know, if you don't listen, if you don't repent, if you don't let my people go, so God was being gracious to this Pharaoh, even though he said, I'm going to bring judgment if you don't listen. Okay, so let's, let's look at it. It looks to me like Moses ought to be ready to go at this point. Wouldn't you agree? God's given him a mission. He has a ministry. And God's equipped him. He's given him miracle power. And he's given him the message. So it looks to me like that he ought to be ready to go. But let's see the next verse. And there's a twist coming. One of the biggest twists that you'll ever see. Did you, you ever see in a, in a movie, maybe? You ever see a twist take place? Uh, a cliffhanger? That's when they would take a break and, and have commercials, right? At the cliffhanger. Well, we're going to see one of those cliffhanger verses. Verse 24. It came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. What? This is Moses. What do you mean? God's given him a mission, given him a ministry, given him miracles, given him a message. It doesn't say God sought to stop him. It says God met him 
and was going to kill him. Why? This is Moses. This is the guy that was the originator of the old covenant. Jesus brought the new covenant. But it's Moses. He's the one that showed up on the Mount Transfiguration there with Elijah. And they talked with Jesus about his death and what it was going to accomplish. This is Moses who parted the Red Sea. with the rock. What's, what's going on? I don't see it. God spent 80 years. And now God says, I'm going to kill him and start all over. Why would God do that? Then Zipporah, this is his wife, she recognized what's going on. And why? And I'll show you that in a minute. Then Zipporah took a sharp stone and cut off the foreskin of her sons and cast it at Moses' feet and said, Surely you're a husband of blood to me. And so, get it, he, God, that's capital H, let him let him, small h, Moses, so God let him go. And then Zipporah said, you're a husband of blood. Now why did all this happen? Notice these next words. Because of the circumcision. You say, I don't get it. I don't, I don't understand that. Well, let, let me help you. Uh, and I don't, I, I'm not just being hard on the men that are here. But I, I want you to grab hold of this. It says it came to pass on the way at the encampment that the Lord met him and sought to kill him. Then Zipporah takes a sharp stone and cuts off the foreskin of Eliezer and Gershom and throws it at Moses' feet and said, Surely your husband of blood to me. And God let him go. Then she said, Your husband of blood. Because of the circumcision. Now, what's going on? Let me help you. Let me help you here. Now, um, maybe the best way I can explain this, and I, and I just want to go right to it. Um, Moses was about to preach something that he hadn't been living. God was sending him to Egypt to be a deliverer, to bring the people out of bondage. And the sign of the covenant of God's people was circumcision. And Moses had not circumcised his own boys. He wasn't living at home about what he was about to talk in public. And God said, you're not going to do that. I'll kill you first. That's how serious this is. And men, listen to me. I'm, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not just getting on us this morning, but you need to become the priest of your own house. Amen. And what had happened in this circumstance, Moses had told Zipporah that that needed to be done to their sons when they were born. But he wimped out because she didn't want to do it. She said, you want to do what to my sons? What? You ain't going to do that. And Moses said, okay. And he wilted away. There comes a place we need to be together as husband and wife. But God has put you, mister, in charge of being a leader in your home. To be the priest of your home. And if you're not leading your home in a godly way, it's going to cost you. And that's what's going on here at this point. And they have a spat at this point. And here's what I want you to see. She goes back home and Moses goes on to do ministry. They're separated. I don't know if they divorced over it or not, but they were separated. And Zipporah and the two boys missed all of the miracles that happened in Egypt. Because daddy hadn't been faithful when he was at home and hadn't been a man that took a position and said, this is how we serve the Lord. That's how serious this is, folks. But I want you to see the humanness of it. God still used Moses in spite of that. And God will use you. Even though you may have faults and failures, God will still use you. But he had to, he had to, he had to step up. 
And when he didn't step up, Zipporah, Zipporah's a strong woman. You got to get, you, you got to see that. She was strong willed. And I understand uh, she was a strong willed wife. But Moses still had a responsibility to wear the pants in his family. And when he didn't do it, it got him in trouble, it got his family in trouble. How you doing out there, guys? Everybody still with me? Okay. I'm just reading the book this morning. You know, I'm just telling you what the book says. And the book says you have a responsibility as the head of the house. So live it up. Amen. Got a lot of women saying amen, but the men are awful quiet. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you, this was a strong woman. I mean, here, here she is now. She, she says, I'll take charge of this. And she gets a sharp stone. And she says to Eliezer and Gershom, come here, boys, pull your pants down. Woo! Hey, let me tell you something. These guys were about 30 years old. At this we're not talking about baby boys. No, no, they, they got to be in their late 20s, early 30s. I mean, he went back to Midian. He was 40, and now he's 80. So there's 40 years that's transpired there. I don't know when he and, 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 and Zipporah got married, but it was probably pretty soon after he got back to Midian, and these two boys were born. So they're at least 20 in their 30s. And she says, pull your pants down, and grabs a sharp So, Oh, listen, men, you don't want to get circumcised when you're 30. Hey, you, you, the puberty had been long gone at this point. She was a strong woman. <laughs> strong will. You say, I'm married to a strong will woman. He was too. But God didn't say that lets you off. Okay. I've preached about that enough, I guess. It was because that he hadn't practiced what he preached. And God was holding him accountable. Let me find my place. And Jethro. Now this is this is after. Now I want to show you that what I'm showing you here, the reason I jumped to this, I want you to see that. He sent her back home, and there was a separation that had taken place. So this is after the deliverance has taken place. This is after the parting of the Red Sea. Jethro, now that's not that Jed Clampett Jethro and the Beverly Hillbillies. This is the priest of Midian. Moses' father-in-law heard, get that, heard of all that God had done for Moses. The reason he heard about it, he wasn't there. And for all of his people. But he wasn't the only one that wasn't, where, wasn't there. The Lord had brought Israel out of Egypt. And then Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, get this, took Zipporah, Moses' wife, after he had sent her back. Who sent her back? Moses. So after the fight, Moses sends his wife back and said, you go back and live with your daddy Jethro with her two sons. And they've missed all of this. And now Jethro hears about it and Jethro brings the boys back. And he said, look, I said I gave her away. I said her mother and I give her away and he's too great. It's time you become responsible again. It's time you took care of that. And so he brings the boys and brings her back to Moses. And Jethro, Moses' father-in-law, came with his sons and his wife to Moses in the wilderness, where he was encamped at the mountain of God. Now he said to Moses, I, your father-in-law, am coming to you with your wife and her sons with her. So separation had happened. Now, why don't I take time to do all that? Listen to me. And I'm not, trying to, I'm not trying to just remind you of something's painful. And I don't want you to raise your hands. But how many of you came from a separational background? 
How many of you had parents that were separated? How many of you maybe are divorced, separated? Here's what I want you to see. That doesn't disqualify you from being used of God. God can still use you, even though you've made mistakes and you've made blunders along the way. If you'll come to a place of total surrendering to God, the divine power of God can still come into your life, still flow in you, and still use you to do a great mission, just like he did Moses. So I want to encourage you this morning. If you've come through that, or maybe in that situation now, don't throw up your hands and say, well, I can never be used of God. Oh, yeah, you can. Yes, you can. God still has a good plan for your life. And he will put that alternate plan into work. Now, it won't ever be like it was when it was first there before the plan messed up. But God has an alternate route. He came the second time and spoke to Jonah after Jonah had messed up. There's a good God. He's able to take our blunders and make them work for his good and his glory. And so Moses told his father-in-law all that had been done. And again, why had he, did he have to tell him about it? Because he hadn't been there. And who else wasn't there? His family, his wife, and his sons. I guess maybe I want to say this, guys. Why this is so important that you live it at home and include your family. Don't cause your family to miss out on what God has because of your disobedience. And how you live is going to impact them. So be sure that you try to be obedient to the Spirit of God. He had problems, Moses did, with Zipporah. But didn't he end there? And I'll, I'll give you this real quick. He also had problems with his siblings. Moses did. You ever have problems with your brother, your sister? <laughs> I don't have to preach long there, do I? Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Miriam and Moses spoke against Moses because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. So Zipporah has died, and now he's married again. He marries this time an, uh, an Ethiopian woman who probably was black, for he had married an Ethiopian woman. And so they said, this is Aaron and Miriam now, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? What does that have to do with the Ethiopian woman? Nothing. You know, I've been in this thing a long time, and I've learned that when people gripe and complain, they usually won't tell you what they're angry about. They'll tell you something else first, but they really are mad about something else. And they come and they say, well, we're all tripped up because of this Ethiopian woman you got to marry. But... Uh, the reason is, really, we're jealous. And you're getting all the glory, and we're not getting any. But they used another excuse. So, here's what happened following that. This, this is good. I didn't give you that at the end of the verse. The Lord heard it. And be sure of this. The Lord hears our griping and our complaining. He hears all of it. And the Lord heard it. Now notice, suddenly, watch the suddenness of the Lord. Suddenly, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, come out, you three, to the tabernacle of meeting. In other words, the Lord says, you three, go out here to my house now. And so the three came out. And then the Lord came down in the pillar of cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle. And he called Aaron, Aaron and Miriam. He says to the two of them, the both of them, step forward. And here's what the Lord said. Now here's my words. He said, I want to say, is there a prophet among you? I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. But not so with my servant Moses. You think you ought to be letting me talk through you. Moses is the one who's faithful in all of my house. I speak with him face to face, even plainly. And I don't tell him dark sayings. He doesn't have to wonder. He sees the form of the Lord. 
Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And then he brings judgment. Miriam's put out of the camp for seven days, but it's with grace and with mercy. And Moses prays for her, and she's forgiven, she's restored, and brought back into the camp. Now, why did I take time to tell you that? Very simply, when you become a child of God, you come into the family of God, you don't have to keep defending yourself. God will defend you. And God defends Moses here. If you're a child of the king, the king will take up for you. He's my elder brother. He can fix it. And he knows how to handle issues that come. So the Lord said, vengeance is mine. I'll take care of it. And he did. He took wonderful care of Moses in the midst of that. Well, I've rumbled a lot of directions this morning. And I've stirred a lot of stuff. What's the Holy Spirit said to you? That's the issue, isn't it? What's he said to you? And I want to tell you, God has a mission and a plan for every one of us here. Quit making excuses. Give yourself totally to God. And let God work through you. You say, but I'm human. I can't speak. Moses said, I learned the lesson. God can fix that. He fixed my mouth. He can fix yours. He can take care of it. He will. What's the Holy Spirit saying to you? Maybe he's calling some of you. Maybe he's calling some of you here to preach. Maybe he's calling you to teach. Maybe he's calling you to take a ministry of prayer. I don't know what God's calling you to do. But I know God's able to help you. Don't make excuses and miss it. And as as we move forward in the days ahead, I, I think you're getting the fact that God does work through humans. I think we've got that. But here's what I want to challenge you to start doing. I want you to start saying to the Lord, I really want to be used, Lord. What do you want me to do? What's my mission? What's my ministry? And he may say to you, I want you to do such and such. There's a neighbor down the street that needs loving. There's a neighbor across the road that needs to hear about me. There's a guy at work who needs to know that I care about him. I don't know what God's mission is for you, but he has one. And if you'll give yourself to him, he'll work through you. He'll do that. And so here, maybe at this we'll close. We're going to, go, going to show, I'm going to show you a video and we're going to have prayer time. And maybe during that time, maybe you might want to just come and pray you have a burden about anything, you can bring that to the Lord, but maybe particularly this morning, in view of what I've preached, you might want to say to the Lord, what's my mission? What do you want me to do? Is there a ministry you're calling me to? One of the greatest days of my life was when I knew God wanted me to preach, and I said yes. I don't know what his mission is for you, But if you ask him, he'll start showing you. And so as we listen to the video, uh, I invite you to come. Bring your burdens to the Lord. Let him fix those things. But just talk to him this morning. Go ahead and go ahead and.